Monday, everyone. Don't have anything to start with, so Matt. Um, yeah. Well, so after the events of, uh, I'm sorry. Let me turn my recorder on. After the events of uh, of Friday, um, particularly the um, the veto at the Security Council, the Secretary's meeting with the Arab uh, and Islamic Foreign Ministers, uh, and then the. Um, emergency determination on the tank munitions uh, to Israel. I, I'm just wondering, um, are, are you guys aware of how isolated you are? So I would answer that by saying every time we engage with one of our partners in the region and our partners around the world, um, what the secretary hears is the indispensability of American leadership, um, both in helping to resolve this conflict and uh, bring an end to it that guarantees the destruction of Hamas and in planning for um, uh, the days and weeks and months and years to come. Now, that doesn't mean that we have agreements with everyone in the region about the best way forward. Obviously, we don't. Um, there are a number of countries that have called for a ceasefire. We've made clear that while we support humanitarian pauses, um, we think a ceasefire that would allow the leadership of Hamas that plotted and planned October 7th to continue to carry on in Gaza and plan future attacks is one that's unacceptable. Um, while we have disagreements, um, uh, ultimately, um, that American leadership is critical both in this conflict and to broader issue to broader issues in the region. And, and you think that you're demonstrating American leadership now? A absolutely, and that, and that and that does not mean that we are going to agree with every country um, any, uh, about everything. How about every I, how about I, any country. So you don't I, agree with any country. Th that is that is not at all maybe Israel. That is not at all. We don't agree with Israel on everything related to this conflict. Well, no, but, uh, but uh, no. What, I, what, what, I, what happened on what happened on Friday and Saturday? And over the weekend, you have one country that stands. So, so with I think if you've doing. looked at the results of our diplomacy um, over the past um, uh, few months, you cannot take any one uh, piece of data, be it a UN Security right. Council vote or anything else, and say that that represents the sum and total of our diplomacy because it doesn't. There are other things that we've done in working with the G7, with partners right. in the region that we'll continue to work on. So the bottom line is, you, you're, you're not concerned that um, you're in, that, that that it appears the rest of the world, with the exception of Israel, I would uh, say is 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 angry at you, and is. is is not you know is uh, is unhappy with the, the position that the administration has taken and that that is American leadership. I would say that Correct. this conflict has posed a number of obstacles for Israel, <laughs> for countries in the region, for United for the United States, for the entire global community, um, and so we are trying to resolve this conflict. As I said, ultimately w with a result that protects civilian lives to the maximum extent possible, that ensures that Hamas cannot. Uh, 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 rearm and refit and launch the attacks of October 7th again. Uh, we're trying to work on how to achieve uh, a lasting, secure peace for the mm -hmm. Palestinian people and the Israeli people and the establishment uh, of an independent Palestinian state. And we are engaged every day from the president and the secretary on down. And I will say that even when we have policy disagreements, including sometimes very serious policy disagreements, uh, every country that we engage with says they want to see America engage. And they want to see America engage both in helping to, uh, uh, to, to, to manage this conflict and helping to prevent the conflict from spreading and helping to plan for post-conflict governance in Gaza okay. and beyond. So, so I, I, the, the, I know that's a long way of answering. The point I'm trying to make is <clears throat> you can't take 
a disagreement at the Security Council or a disagreement over pieces of the policy, and I think impute broader, um, uh, you know, uh, broader trends from that, other than to say that, of course, this conflict is posing challenges for every country in the world. It's posing, you know, very serious challenges, of course, to, to, to the government of Israel and posing very severe difficulties to the Palestinian people. That's, the, I think, the, the first order question. For the United States, we're going to continue to try and stay involved because we think it's in, in the interests of the Israel, the Palestinian people, broader regional security, and, of course, the security of the United okay. States. Last one. I, you're very fond of saying, you and every previous administration I've covered, very fond of saying, in terms of numerous conflicts, almost every conflict around the world, that there is no military solution to this. And yet your actions over the course of the last five days suggest that you think that there is or that the only solution to this conflict is military. Is that an accurate reading? No, I don't think that's an accurate because I don't. So you I, don't no, think there's a military let me, let me just, solution? No, let me let me answer it this way. I don't think it's an accurate reading because I think there would be other conflicts where we say there are potential military solutions. We think which, the, we which think the Ukra we think the Ukrainian military repelling Russian forces from their borders would right. be a military solution to that conflict. Well, no, there yeah, could, but that, that, but that you've always I, talked about diplomacy I, I, at of, the end. Of and, of course, and there will have to be diplomacy at the end, but the, as an immediate diplomacy at the end with it, Hamas as, between Israel and Hamas. No, I was talking about the, the first okay. conflict. With respect well. to this conflict, we think there can be a military solution to um, uh, taking out the leadership of Hamas that planned and uh, carried out the attacks of October 7th uh, in taking out the militants who crossed into Israel and carried out those attacks. Um, ultimately, there is not a military solution to the broader issues between the Israeli people and the Palestinian people. That is something that cannot be solved militarily. It has to be something that is solved uh, eventually, in our judgment, with the establishment of an independent Palestinian state. Okay, thanks. Mary, go ahead. Hi, Matt. I have a couple of things. Um, so the, this administration earlier this year unveiled an overhauled arms export policy with increased emphasis on human rights. Um, let me read this your policy back to you, quote, no arms transfer will be authorized where the United States assesses that it is more likely than not that the arms to be transferred will be used by the recipient to commit, facilitate recipient's commission of, or to aggravate risks that the recipient will commit genocide, crimes against humanity, grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions of 1949, including attacks intentionally directed against civilian objects or civilians protected as such, or other serious violations of international humanitarian or human rights law, end quote. So just want to understand, given the flow of weapons transfers to Israel, is it the U.S. assessment that its weapons provided to Israel are not being used in any of the situations that I've just read out loud and are described in this policy? So I will say that our expectation of every country to whom we provide military assistance, weapons and other assistance, is that they use that assistance in full compliance with international humanitarian law and the laws of war, and Israel is no exception. Right. But at the moment, you just told me your expectation. However, there has been some results on the ground that we have seen. So. What is the U.S. assessment on the results that it has seen so far on the ground? So if, uh, let me take that in a couple of ways. One, if, you, if with respect to any specific, you know, I get asked sometimes about a specific strike or a specific use of, of an arms. I'm not able to offer an assessment here from this podium. I often don't ha have all the available information. With respect to the overall uh, uh, use of arms, we have not made any specific determination of the type that you, you know, laid out in the, the intro to the question, but we have said, we think there are more things that Israel can do to minimize civilian harm. The Secretary talked about some of those week this weekend. We think there needs to be more predictability in the South for when humanitarian pauses can take take place. Uh, we need there needs to be more predict predictability in terms of the corridors that humanitarian that that civilians could use to get themselves out of harm's way and in designated time periods when those are protected. There needs to be more predictability in those same corridors so aid can come in. And with respect to the use of the weapons we provide, and with respect to the use of weapons that we don't provide, but that Israel uses on its own, we have been clear in all of our conversations with them that they need to comply with international humanitarian law and the laws of war. We have been quite clear with that at the highest possible levels of this government, and that and will continue to do so. Right. And just a couple of more things. Sorry. Um, are you? Could you say that U.S. has a full understanding of where exactly? 
the weapons and the ammunition that it has sent to Israel are being used, like locations and specific offensives, specific fighting, and all of that. I, I just can't you're keeping I, track of it. I can't. I would refer you to pen, the Pentagon for a more specific assessment. I, I, I can't do so from here. Right. And the final thing is, like, Secretary talked about the gap, and you're you're referring to his comments yesterday. He he sort of laid out like more pauses and specific humanitarian corridors for people uh, to, to, to assistance, for assistance to find its way. But right now, we're basically looking at a bit of a like societal breakdown inside Gaza, in Khan Yunus, um, where even if, the, even if there's an increase in the number of aid trucks going in, it's simply not going to the people. Have you, have this, has this administration had conversations with the Israelis over the weekend on this specific challenge and what assurances have they given you? Uh, yes, we have had specific um, uh, uh, conversations with them. Uh, our special envoy on the ground, David Satterfield, has had in-person meetings with the Israeli government about these very issues over the weekend. Um, we've had them at the highest levels of this department to make very clear that more needs to be done to get humanitarian access Access in. Um, we have seen, um, so as you know, if to, just to give it some, some context, we saw expanded levels of humanitarian access during the pause. Part of that was that the government of Israel was allowing more humanitarian access to get in through the Rafah crossing. Part of that was because there was a pause, it was much more easy, it was much easier for the enablers, the deliverers of humanitarian access to move it around Gaza. Since the, the resumption of combat operations in the south, we have seen uh, the, the Israeli government decide to, to let more humanitarian assistance in, which is good, something we support, something that we have urged them to do and have been gratified that they have done. And there has been, uh, the, the problem is now getting that humanitarian access, th not just through Rafa, but then delivered to the people that who need it. And that goes to the, what I was laying out at the beginning, which is there needs to be more predictability in terms of when there are pauses, where there are pauses so civilians can get to safe areas and so the humanitarian access can um, uh, can be delivered. And I will say we are laser focused on that and have had uh, have had you know ongoing, sometimes nearly hourly conversations with the government of Israel, as well as I should say with United Nations agencies about how exactly to implement that. Jen. Matt, can I follow up? You, you and the Secretary have laid out these additional steps you'd like to see Israel take, but have you given them any ultimatum to actually take those steps? Will there be any punitive measures if they ref continue to refuse to do so? So I am never going to speculate about what steps we might take uh, uh, in public. I will say that if you look at the totality of the Secretary's engagements uh, with the government of Israel um, on his first trip to the region, um, went to Israel, went around the region, came back and said to the government of Israel, we need you to open Rafa Gate to allow humanitarian access in. And as you may recall, there was a big negotiation over that, and ultimately we got humanitarian access in. On a second trip to the region, uh, he came and said, we need to see humanitarian pauses, and was very clear with the government of Israel that that's what we wanted to see. You might remember that the government of Israel rejected it out of hand publicly a few days later, started to implement daily humanitarian pauses of, I think, six hours or so. We eventually saw those expanded to, to other pauses. We are continuing to engage with them now on things we want to see. Last week, we were engaging with them to get more fuel in so you could run desalinization, desalinization uh, plants so people get water, so, so humanitarian access could be delivered. And I think, as you know, initially there was a reluctance to allow a certain amount of fuel in. That level of fuel has gone up. So the approach that we have taken of in conducting you know, intense diplomacy and then sometimes having some very direct, candid conversations with them about what our expectations are and what we want to see done has delivered results. Does that mean there's not more to be done? Of course not. There is very much more to be that, that can be done, and we will continue to engage with these in these conversations with them. But Matt, I mean, international humanitarian groups, these ministers he met with on Friday are saying there's not time for this incremental approach. There's not time for this to take weeks and weeks to play out. So are you putting additional pressure on them to say, like, this needs to be done in the coming days, the coming hours, as we, the situation on the ground is completely collapsed. We do not want to see it take weeks. We share those concerns about the situation on the ground, which is very, very difficult, uh, extremely difficult for civ civilians right now uh, in, in Gaza to access the food, the water, the medicine uh, they need. It's uh, uh, tough to move around in the middle of a conflict. So we're going to continue to have these conversations uh, with the government of Israel. But I haven't said it yet in this briefing. I haven't been asked yet in this briefing. I do want to reiterate that 
This is only a challenge because Hamas continues to embed itself inside the civilian population in southern Gaza, in Khan Yunus, in the very places where we are trying to get humanitarian assistance into civilians. The reason it is so difficult to do all this is that Hamas will not vacate its tunnels. Hamas will not stop hiding behind civilians. Hamas will not lay down its arms. So uh, we always need to remember that the, that the situation uh, that Israel is operating in is really unprecedented in trying to conduct urban warfare in this very dense environment where you have an opponent who just carried out a brutal terrorist attack and is committed to carrying out more terrorist attacks continues to hide behind civilian, uh, uh, the civilian population. Now, that in no way lessens Israel's responsibility, and in no way lessens our commitment to be very clear with Israel about what their responsibility is. But I do think we have to remember that that's what makes this thing so difficult from the beginning. I have one more on Israel and one on yeah. a separate topic. Um, photos emerged, I don't think you've been asked about this at the podium, photos emerged uh, last week um, of Israeli forces detaining, blindfolding, and having stripped down men in Gaza. Uh, does the State Department have any comment on this? Do you think it's appropriate for such images to be taken? Do you agree with the Israeli assessment that these were Hamas fighters, given there are people who are saying these are normal civilians, family members? So those images were, uh, we found those images deeply disturbing, and we are seeking more information, uh, both about the, the nature of the images and, of course, uh, why they're public in the first place. Have you gotten any responses uh, from the We Israeli are seeking government? more information. I don't have a um, uh, response at this point. And can I ask on a separate topic? Yeah, uh, Alexei Navalny's team says he has been missing for several days. They have no idea where he is. Does state have any information on his whereabouts or what's going on there? Um, we do not have any information about his whereabouts. We are deeply concerned for Mr. Navalny's well-being after his lawyers have stated that they have not been able to contact him for almost a week now uh, and after he did not appear at his scheduled court appearance today. We have communicated to the Russian government that they are responsible for what happens to Mr. Navalny uh, while he's in their custody, and they will be held accountable by the international community. <clears throat> we have repeatedly joined Mr. Navalny's family, family his colleagues, supporters around the world in calling for his immediate release without conditions and for the Russian government to end its continued repression of independent voices in Russia who are subject to relentless harassment and intimidation for exercising their human rights and will continue to uh, uh, follow the cases of everyone in Russia who has been illegally detained. Sorry, quick clarification. You've communicated that message to Russia since the news of him we going have. missing? We have. And at what level was that communicated? Uh, I don't have a specific readout. I mean, I'll, I'll come in for his I'm, uh, picture. Said, no, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to call him. I'll come. I will, you, you know, every day, every day I come to you. So go ahead. I know you do. I wanted to ask a slightly different version of what Humaira has been asking about, and, and to specify that this is without regard to internal deliberations, specific attacks, any formal determinations the U.S. may have made. Is, is the U.S. collecting any information about whether war crimes have been committed in Gaza by either side? So we are monitoring everything that happens in this conflict. Um, we are engaged in conversations with the Israeli government, and I don't have any further any, anything further to say about uh, our internal activities at the State Department. Monitoring. I mean, I know it's a flawed comparison, but in the case of Ukraine and Russia, the U.S. was collecting information through open source and intelligence sources and sharing those actively with, you know, allies and other organizations. So is a similar sort of activity underway? I don't think you can compare them because, as you say, it is a very different environment. It's a very different uh, place on the ground. But I will say that we're not only are we monitoring, but we are in close contact, in close communication with the Israeli government. There are a number of times where um, we have sought information about specific uh, actions that they have taken. I've talked about that, uh, about some of those from this podium. For example, or I, I shouldn't say I did, the secretary um, uh, uh, mentioned last week the fact the strike that killed a Reuters journalist in Lebanon. Um, secretary said that we have uh, communicated uh, our interest in finding out what happened to the Israeli government, and they've said that they are investigating it. We think that's appropriate, and we'll continue to have those very direct conversations. Okay, specifically on the question of war crimes, I mean, the U.S. believes I assume that there needs to be accountability if it is determined that war crimes are committed again by either side. Of course. And is the U.S. interested in being a participant and arbiter of this, or if not, is there another country or body the U.S. is interested in? I just don't want to, to, to address a hypothetical. Right. Yeah. I have others that I hope you'll come back to. Okay, I'll come back. Say so, go ahead. Thank you. I just want to follow up very quickly on the, the, the issue raised by Jennifer on the picture of the, of the men stripped down and so on. Uh, you agree with the spokesman for the Israeli government who said, you know, this is the Middle East and it gets a bit warm. That's why they just. So I haven't yeah. seen that. Yeah, I, I, okay. I, so hold, so I haven't seen that comment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
so I don't want to comment in specifics, but I would say that is certainly not a sentiment that we would agree with. We always have been clear with Israel about the necessity of acting in full compliance with international humanitarian law, and that does require that it protects civilians and de uh, treat detained individuals humanely and with dignity. Mm. I have a couple more questions. Uh, the Saudi foreign minister suggested that the Palestinian foreign minister, Riyad Malki, was basically given a gag order that he could not speak uh, in Washington. Could you clarify this? Uh, no, that's not accurate. So I will say um, this gets a little complicated because it goes back to a law right. from, right. you know, um, uh, 30 years ago at this point. So uh, I think the first claim that was made publicly was that we had imposed a visa restriction right. uh, that prohibits from him from speaking. That is not accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no statute in, or there's no provision in U.S. law that allows the imposition of such a visa restriction, and we have imposed no such visa restriction. Mm -hmm. There is a provision in U.S. law going back to uh, 1990, uh, 1987, um, right. uh, the Anti-Terrorism you know, anti Act, that prohibits the expenditure of PLO funds inside the United States. Um, there have been waivers issued uh, for that law in the past. Congress has changed the the requirements for the secretary to issue one of those to issue those waivers, such that they cannot be met uh, under uh, current law. But in no way, uh, I would say those those. Uh, the provisions of that law all rate all relate to the expenditure of funds, um, so they in no way limit anyone's ability to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, just a couple more questions. Now you said that the stated goals, Israel's stated goals, which you agree with, which is to to end Hamas, you know, defeat Hamas, uh, change the regime in, in Gaza, however that whatever that means, and so on, you know, and uh, free the hostages. Now it has been. 65 days. We have not seen any Hamas leaders brought out or killed or named as such and so on. So you expect this thing to go for another 65 days? I do not before, have. Before, I, they, before they achieve their goals? I, I do not have an expectation for how mm -hmm. long this will go. That's uh, mm -hmm. for, to the Israeli government to speak to. They have killed and have been quite public okay. about the fact that they have killed a number of Hamas fighters. Okay. So, so, I mean, looking at the situation, this could go on for conceivably. Conceivably, another 65. Now, uh, okay. You know, Saeed, I just said okay. I wouldn't okay. want to speculate on the outcome, so I don't think you can follow that up by right. adding now, now speculation just, to, yeah. to, to what I've said. Yeah. Okay. Now, you, you also said that you, you want to see a resolution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict where there's a, a two-state solution and so on, all that stuff that the U.S. has always been stating all along for 30 years at least and so on. Now, today, today, uh, the Israeli prime minister spoke to the defense and foreign relations committees in the Knesset. And he said two things. He said no Palestinian state, no to Palestinian state, under any circumstances. No, no, no Palestinian authority in Gaza, no Hamas and so on. So do you have any comment on what the, 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 the prime minister of Israel who obviously wields a great deal of power? I mean, you know, he's um, destroying the Palestinians to smithereen. You have any so, comment on what he said? I think I said earlier in this briefing that we don't agree with Israel on everything, right. and certainly right. this would be example, an example. The secretary has been quite clear right. on what our goal is for post-conflict governance. Right. Uh, the president has been quite clear that we want to see the Palestinian Authority re, you know, reunite, uh, uh, reuniting the West Bank um, uh, and Gaza. Um, making clear we don't want to see any Israeli occupation, making clear we don't want to see a reduction of Gazan territory. So we have laid out the principles that the United States stands by, and we will continue to engage, not just with the government of Israel, but with our other partners in the region about how to make those, uh, turn those principles into reality. So why not say, this is the Palestinian state that we recognize. It is, its borders are this, it is this, this, and so on. Its characteristics are, are such and such. Why not do that? Because we think ultimately this is best resolved by diplomacy and negotiations, which is what we're pursuing. Thank you, Matt. Um, would you say that under U.S. law, that any individuals or entity or government that provide financial support to a terrorist organization is um, um, vulnerable to, or liable rather, to prosecution by the U.S. government? You know, I don't think I'm going to start speaking to any prosecutions by the U.S. government from this podium. That's a matter for the Justice Department, let alone hypothetical ones. Yeah, but 
you know for a fact that anybody who gives material support to a terrorist organization, I, I, you will put them, you will accuse them of supporting this I, terrorist organization. I know the status of U.S. law about material support for uh, for terrorism, but uh, when it comes to speaking about who might get prosecuted, who might get not, you understand that's not something sure. that the State Department does. Okay, I'm just asking you a question because uh, I'm sure you saw the Times report that the Israeli intelligence, with the approval of Netanyahu, has carried suitcases full of cash to Hamas. And the purpose was declared, and this is quotes, that basically this is the only way to prevent a two-state solution, if we can only prop up the extremist Hamas in Gaza. So in this case, won't the Israeli government will be uh, liable for persecution because they given financial aid to a terrorist organization that you list on your own State Department website as a terrorist uh, organization? Again, I'm not going to speak to prosecutions from uh, from this podium. It's not something we do at the State Department, and it's not something we speak to. The Justice Department is quite clear about they're the only ones inside the government that, that speak to prosecutions. Okay. Um, the, you saw the UN report that uh, Gaza, half of Gazans actually are facing starvation, um, apart from Hamas, who you blame uh, normally. Who else is bearing responsibility for half of the population that actually can be starving? So I, what I think is that everyone involved in this conflict needs to do more to allow humanitarian assistance to get in and allow the people in Gaza to be able to move around to get access to humanitarian assistance. Of course, that there is uh, 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 Israeli government plays a role in that. Partners in the region play a role in that. The UN agencies play a role in that. And the United States is actively working with all of them to try to increase the amount of humanitarian assistance that gets in for those civilians who desperately need it. OK, and finally, um, you described these images as disturbing. And you said you're seeking more information from the Israelis on this. But actually, by definition, according to the Geneva Convention, if an army, which is in this case, these videos were released by the Israeli army, filming a civilian population, we know some of them are civilians because some of our colleagues, including journalists, were among them. You take pictures of them and you put them publicly. That's already a violation of uh, the Geneva Convention and how do you treat prisoners of war. So why do you need to seek more information where you can actually condemn because this as, I as said, a violation of international law? Because all we've seen are the images. And as I said, we're seeking more information about both the status uh, of those individuals, the status, uh, uh, the circumstances in those videos, and how ultimately they become became public, which is very relevant to the very question you asked. Michelle, go ahead. Thank you. I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Uh, did the U.S. first warn the, the Iraqi Prime Minister al Sudani of Harsh on sequences if Iraq does not act to stop the attacks on American and American facilities in Iraq? So what I will say is that we have had conversations with the Iraqi government, and the, that includes the secretary who traveled to Iraq uh, several weeks ago to meet in person with Prime Minister Sudani and then had a, a phone conversation with him a little over a week ago to, make, uh, to speak about a number of things. But one of the things he made very clear in that conversation is the same thing our ambassador has made clear and the same thing others in the U.S. government have made clear, that U.S. forces are in Iraq at the invitation of the Iraqi government. They're there con um, uh, uh, conducting an anti-terrorism mission that benefits the Iraqi people. And we, of course, expect the Iraqi government to do more to, to hold accountable the Iranian-backed militias who uh, first were launching strikes against um, U.S. military installations and U.S. military personnel, and then as recently as last week, were launching strikes against our embassy. So we very much do expect the Iraqi government to do more. And as we have always said, we will take whatever actions we need to as the United States to defend U.S. personnel, defend U.S. interests. And second, uh, on Lebanon, uh, Israeli Defense Minister has said today that uh, Israel is open to the possibility of reaching uh, an agreement with Hezbollah if it includes a safe zone on the border and guarantees. Do you have any comment on that? Will the U.S. mediate between uh, Israel and Lebanon to reach uh, such uh, agreement? So I'm not going to comment specifically on that report or on that proposal, but I will say that one of our goals from the beginning of this conflict has been to prevent it from widening, and that, of course, includes from widening uh, uh, northern Israel into Lebanon. Um, we have had conversations about that with the Israeli government and encouraged the, and, and said that we very much do not want to see the conflict from widening. For, to, from to, we do not want to see the conflict widen, and have had conversations with other partners in the region and. We would support, uh, I won't say anything, but we would support steps that would achieve that goal. And are you aware of any ultimatum that uh, the Israeli government issued to Lebanon to, or to the Lebanese uh, no, government? No, I'm not. Thanks.
Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Matt. In light of a recent uh, Jerusalem Post report about a UN agency, UNRWA, school teacher in Gaza holding a hostage captive in an UNRWA school, as well as uh, teachers at UNRWA schools in Gaza praising the attacks on social media with ties between Hamas terrorists and the agency schools, is President Biden now willing to defund this terrorist UN organization, UNRWA, and I have a follow-up. So I would just say with respect to that first report, we saw that report, we sought information from UNRWA about it. I would uh, add that to our knowledge, that report has never been verified. Um, certainly if that were the case, we would expect accountability for the individual involved. But I do want to speak on, uh, about UNRWA specifically. UNRWA is, UNRWA is providing life-saving work for Palestinians right now under very difficult circumstances. Uh, we've seen, I think it's more than 100 UNRWA staff killed during this conflict um, while they are out trying to get food and water and medicine to the Palestinian people. The work that they are doing uh, is essential. It is saving lives. Uh, the United States continues to be the largest donor to, of humanitarian access to the Palestinian people. Um, uh, uh, we continue to support UNRWA for the work that it's doing. And we'll continue to do it because they are, I will say, as I, as I said a moment ago, um, actually they're on the front lines. UNRWA staff putting their lives at risk to get food, water, medicine to children, to babies, to civilians. So we absolutely support the work that they're doing. Okay, in light of that Jerusalem Post re report, of 100 Hamas terrorists confirmed to have graduated from UNRWA schools, what level of terrorist involvement with UNRWA will it take to motivate President Biden to condemn the UNRWA terrorism. So, so we always condemn terrorism, and I think that's pretty clear just based on what you hear me say from this podium every day and what you've heard me say about Hamas since October 7th. Um, but, but I do want to reiterate what I said about the life-saving work that UNRWA is doing uh, and how important it is that that work not just continue, but that it be expanded. We would welcome other um, uh, countries increasing their levels of support to UNRWA because we really do think the work they're doing uh, is essential. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Jan. Thank you. I have two questions. Uh, first question, Kurt Campbell, the nominee for the Deputy Secretary of State, said at the Congressional Confirmation hearing that he has a skeptical uh, stance on North Korea coming to diplomatic table to give up its nuclear weapons. Then what are the other alternatives for the United States to denuclearize North Korea? I don't want to speak to hypotheticals. I will say that uh, we will continue to encourage diplomacy with North Korea. That has been our policy all along. Um, but I think it's safe to say that his skepticism is well-founded, given that uh, we have um, uh, uh, seen North Korea refuse to accept our offer to pursue diplomatic alternatives since uh, the beginning of this administration. And beyond that, I wouldn't want to speculate. As, about, long, as long as North Korea is providing arms and ammunition to Russia, do you think uh, South Korea should continue to provide our artillery shares to support to Ukraine? I, I just don't have any comment on that. I'll let South Korea speak to its own decisions. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, just if you have any reaction to the Washington Post report that uh, Israel used white phosphorus on uh, civilians in southern Lebanon. And then a second question. Uh, you mentioned in your earlier in the press conference that uh, Secretary Blinken referenced the killing of uh, Issam Abdullah. And yet just Friday or Saturday, was it, you fast-tracked 13,000 of the same shells that killed him. So is there like an incongruity to, to what the department is doing and saying? Let me, let me speak to the first question um, first, which is that we are concerned by the reports uh, of the use of white phosphorus. Obviously, there is a legitimate military use for white phosphorus, but that does not include um, using them on civilians. It means that if you use them, you have to do everything you can to minimize civilian harm. Um, Any time that we provide items like white phosphorus or really anything to another military, we do it with the expectation that it will be used uh, for legitimate purposes and in full keeping with uh, international humanitarian law and the ar law of armed conflict. So we're looking into this and, and looking for additional information. And then with respect to, to your first question, you heard the Secretary speak to this yesterday. If any of you were up early on a Sunday or early-ish, um, you would have heard him speak to this and make clear that, look, Israel is engaged in a very difficult military campaign against a terrorist organization that says it wants to repeat the attacks of October 7th. Um, uh, he decided that on this, on, uh, on, with respect to this sale, sale, 
This was uh, a munition that they needed on an urgent basis, and so uh, it necessitated an emergency authorization to, to provide those, uh, those munitions, but that does not not in any way lessen uh, their obligation to act in full, full compliance with international humanitarian law. And by the way, that goes for not just the munitions we provide them, but that the munitions that they procure from other countries or that the munitions that they um, manufacture themselves. They are, we expect them and they should expect themselves to comply with humanitarian law with respect to any weapon that they use. Matt, just on the way from yeah. person, I mean, this, this report today is not the first of its kind to allege that Israel has used white phosphorus in this conflict. They go back to, like, I think October 13th, You've never expressed concern about them before, which suggests to me that you didn't believe them. Why now, all of a sudden, are you saying you're concerned so by this report? The, different, the difference with respect to this report is that um, the reporting, the story in the Post, um, and again, it's a report, it's why we're seeking more information, purported that it was used, um, uh, if not against a civilian target, had significant impact on civilian targets. So that's the, that's okay. the. So, so you that's, don't, you, that's, you, so, so in that, October, that's the back, reason back for. in October, in the first week of this war, when there were allegations that, uh, from Amnesty and others, that, that white phosphorus have been used by Israel in Gaza. So that you have no problem so with. So white phosphorus. There are legitimate military uses for white phosphorus. Yeah. So, are you, so suggest, the, are you saying so, that there was no that there was no civilian impact no, when, they, when when when. I'm, no, These were used allegedly no, in, in Gaza. I'm saying the specific the specific reporting that we saw in the Washington Post is something that we were concerned about. the reporting that you saw so back I would, on October 13th? Uh, if, if, if you want to refresh my memory about what that specific report is, I, will be, I, I would be glad to I'll look at it. I'll send it to you. I looked but it up it was, because I was surprised but that it was, John Kirby said the exact It was the specific details in this story mm -hmm. that we found concerning and why we're seeking more in, information about it. Okay. Go ahead, Can I ask a clarification yeah. on what you said about Assam? Um, because I just checked Secretary Blinken's uh, comments from Thursday. Um, he says it's my understanding that the Israelis are carrying out an investigation. But I think you said that the United States government has actually sought information about the incident after our um, story has come out. Is that right? We uh, engaged in a conversation with the Israeli government. They told us that it's an under investigation. Right. Correct. Thank you. So, go ahead. A different topic. There's some reporting uh, today that some federal agencies are mobilizing to protect against cyber threats, particularly from the PRC targeting or having a potential impact on the 2024 elections. Was this brought up at all in the bilaterals in uh, San Francisco? So I'm not going to speak to um, everything that's um, uh, brought up in the in bilaterals, but you may recall uh, there have been other reports of, of Chinese cyber activity um, previously uh, this year around the time that the secretary was engaging in meetings with his counterpart Wang Yi, uh, and as we said at the time, we Chinese cyber activities are something that we typically raise in our meetings with them uh, uh, and have done so for some time. Can I just directly relate it to that? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just because in recent reporting about um, cyber, Chinese uh, military cyber actors embedding in some critical U.S. infrastructure, it was noted in that report that President Biden, in his bilateral with President Xi, did not raise that topic. So just specifically on that issue, has Secretary Blinken, in his recent interactions, raised uh, what is now known to be a significant Chinese presence in some critical U.S. infrastructure? I, I, just, I just don't ha want to give a specific readout about what our um, uh, private diplomatic conversations, but this is an issue that we have raised on a number of, uh, of, of occasions with the Chinese government. Uh, we have long been concerned about their cyber espionage and other uh, intrusive cyber techniques. Can I go back for an update yeah, uh, on, yeah. on um, aid coming in and, and Americans coming out? Can you just give us, since it's been a few days, the, the latest figure of Americans who have gotten out of Gaza and they're still waiting to leave? Sure. The number of Americans, Amer and again, it's American citizens, legal permanent residents, and their family members. I know you know that. So just for the, I can see you shaking the head, but I always have to give the qualifier just so it's Not clear what, what, I, what I'm talking about. Um, uh, over 1,200 uh, who have made it out now, and there are somewhere around 900 who are remaining. And to circle back on those reports of a potential American casualty, somebody who is waiting to leave Gaza, 
It, have you we still have not been able to confirm it. It's something we're trying to do. I had a follow-up conversation with someone today trying to get more information and confirmed that, uh, that no, we have not been able to track down any further details or confirm that, in fact, that there's an American citizen who died. Have you in enlisted Gaza. the Israelis in helping verify that? Uh, we have tried. I don't want to speak to, to specific um, uh, methods, but we have tried a number of different avenues to try to confirm whether this person indeed died. The safety and security of any American citizen anywhere in the world is our first priority. It's our, of utmost concern. We're actively trying to confirm information and just haven't been able to do so as of yet. Okay. And I just go back? Oh, Maybe two no, I just want to go back to this white phosphorus thing because I pulled it up. Right. This is the, this is the, I'm just going to read you the first sentences. Amnesty International's crisis response program gathered compelling evidence documenting the use of white phosphorus artillery shells by the Israeli army in densely populated civilian areas in Gaza. Again, so that didn't bother you. Again, you I don't know. You didn't no, express concern me, then about, about, about that. I don't this know this. Is, so I mean, I, I'll, I'll send it I to know, you but I don't know the specifics of whether people were evacuated from those areas before they were used. I don't know any of the specifics. Does, does this, it matter? It, it, well, certainly. It October 13th. Certainly I mean, would people matter. If people, if people, if people, just say, if people had moved out of an area and you were only have, there were only military attacks, of course it would, it would, it would matter. I would say, Matt, but let me just say, any time that we saw white phosphorus being used in a way that would, min that would um, harm civilians, of course it was something that we would be concerned about, which is why when we saw the reports in the Post, we said that it's something we found concerning and are seeking well, more I'm information about. I'm just curious about. as to why you didn't find it concerning the first time it was reported. So October 13th, I think I was on a trip to the Middle East, not standing, I, here, at this, not standing so here at this podium taking well, questions. Okay. Had, you, had I been here and you asked me questions, maybe I would have said that. Sorry, can I yeah, ask a clarification ahead. on your clarification? Because um, engaged, clarification of my clarification. Yeah, because engaged in conversations is like diplo speak, um, and it's just when you, when the U.S. government, when you guys saw the uh, Reuters investigation about the killing of Islam Abdullah uh, by an Israeli um, by Israeli tank fire, did you ask a question to the Israelis? Like, what, what is engaged not, in conversation? I, I am not going to um, uh, get into those private diplomatic conversations, but we saw the report. We wanted to have more information about it. We engaged with uh, the Israeli government, as we do quite regularly um, uh, with these types of reports, and we're, we're told it was under investigation. But was the question about, um, you know, targeting of journalists, or was it whether... Uh, they were the same shells that are provided by the U.S. I'm, like, what, what I'm, was the? I'm what not going to speak to this specific engagement, but we regularly engage with them about the importance of engaging in international humanitarian law, the importance of doing everything they can to minimize civilian harm, and that, of course, includes journalists. And did they give you a time frame on when their investigation uh, about I'm them just and not, all that, of the that, that is a, that were wounded that is a question, completed? That is a question for them to answer. It's a, it pertains to their investigation. Okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, Matt, thank you. Mark Stone from Sky News. Uh, can I just return to the images of the, the Palestinians uh, stripped uh, and in the back of vehicles and, and seemingly handing in weapons? Um, why not just condemn the images now? Um, wh why wait uh, for uh, an, an investigation, as, you, as you've asked for? As I said, we found them deeply disturbing. I just don't have a, 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 any additional comment on but, it. But can I follow up? Is, sure. is there any circumstance in which those sorts of images would be acceptable? Again, uh, we found them disturbing. I don't want to, to, to discuss other potential um, uh, circumstances. We have found the, them uh, disturbing. We've asked them to clarify the circumstances of these detentions, and we're going to um, uh, look to them to provide those details. And, and how long will you wait uh, I, before? I, I'm, I just, okay, can, I'm can not I ask gonna, a Again, we're, that is how long it will take is a question for them. We have pressed them for details about these circumstances. We expect them to provide Okay, because the reason I ask is because on, on many different um, moments uh, over the course of the past however many weeks it has been, we've heard the American administration say we've asked for, you know, we're concerned or we've asked for clarification, we've asked for more detail, uh, and yet the moments keep coming. And, and I wonder, um, is it actually the case that you are behind the scenes actually not that worried about Israel's tactics, its military tactics so, on the ground, so or, let me, let me just, or, let me just, or, or have you lost all leverage with, with so, a close ally? So uh, I appreciate the gotcha nature of the question. It, it, let, me, no, no, let, me, let me just. Matt, genuinely, let me, it's not. No, it's, it's, it's not. Sure. I'm not no, no, Gen I want to be clear. Genuinely, no, no, genuinely it is, but that's okay. It's, I, it's no, fair. No, it's I, not I take, okay. I'm not, it's I, not a gotcha if moment. You, if it's you stop, I'll answer the question. I answer questions of, of all types. Uh, I will say that you should take our words at face value. When we're, say, we're concerned about something, it's because we're concerned. And when we say that we have direct, candid, 
sometimes quite difficult conversations with the Israeli government, it's because we do. And I will go back to something that I said in earlier in this briefing. When you look at the totality of our engagement with the Israeli government um, over the course of this conflict, there have been a number of times where we went to them and said, this is an action we need you to take. And the, action, the reaction from them has been, oh, it's something that we can't do. It will be very difficult. You've seen them come out publicly and reject it. And we work on it behind the scenes, and we deliver results. We've done that with respect to pauses. We've done that respect to humanitarian assistance. You've seen us do that just in the past week with respect to fuel. You've seen it, us do it with, with deconfliction zones in the south to ensure that there are places where civilians can be that are the deconfliction sites so they're not struck by the, the, the Israeli military. So we mean very much what we say. We follow up with the Israeli government. Sometimes things don't move as, as uh, quickly as the public would want. They don't move as quickly as we want. But we engage with them on these tough conversations because we care very much about getting this right. We care about protecting civilians. We care about getting access them access to the care that they need. And so we will continue to engage with the Israeli government at all levels on all of these issues. So, so Lawrence, no, if there, I could just, I'm, I'm just okay. that's a lot. Thank you Go ahead. very much, Matt. I want to dedicate this question to my father, a journalist who started the Frontier Post 40 years ago from Peshawar, who passed away two days ago. Um, uh, both the questions are dedicated to him. Uh, number one question is Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, relations have uh, uh, are going down. Imran Khan even uh, wrote a special letter uh, about it from jail the other day where he said that the relationship are going very down and the way Pakistan is kicking out the Afghan is very disrespectful. And uh, uh, my father personally played a very positive role in bringing peace during the Civil War days in Afghanistan. Uh, just uh, is, is the U.S. at all concerned about uh, the uh, relationship going bad? Um, so first of all, let me just start by offering my condolences to you. I obviously didn't know your father, but he sounds like an incredible man. Um, and I'm sure it's uh, very tough for you and your entire family to, to, to lose him. So um, uh, my thoughts are, are certainly with you at this time. With respect to um, relations between Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, obviously we support diplomatic resolution to all of the various issues between their, those two countries. It's something that we have been engaged on. Um, uh, we've detailed the, the substance of some of those specific engagements over the past few weeks, and we will continue to do so. Thank you. Just one um, more, one more one, question one more. about him. One more question just about his journalism. Uh, um, so the uh, investigative journalism was something introduced in Pakistan by him in the mid-'80s. And one of the stories that he has regularly been uh, writing about, and I know the State Department does not take any position between political parties. You have said that many times to me, especially with regard to Cypher. But regarding condemnation, the U.S. does not support corrupt and criminal leaders around the world. That's a clear fact. In Pakistan, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif three-time prime minister. And the Frontier Post had published stories about him taking money from Osama bin Laden to, to disrupt Benazir government. The story was not condemned. Taking state land, story was not condemned or challenged in any court. Uh, sending money internationally, basically financial uh, money laundering thing, story was never challenged. At least condemn that. Okay, the U.S. had no role in Imran Khan removal, but at least say something about that a Panama paper convict has come back to Pakistan. American, Pakistani Americans are upset at Biden for being silent about it. They feel like you have brought this old corrupt criminal leader back into Pakistan and, are, you know, he's coming back to... So at least condemn the so, corrupt politicians. So I will just say, with the, with respect to that, the, especially the last part of your question, that the United States does not play any role in choosing um, uh, the leaders of Pakistan. Um, uh, we engage with the the um, leadership shown by or leadership decided by the Pakistani people, and we will continue to engage with the government of Pakistan on all these issues. Go ahead, Thank and so then we'll much. wrap today. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, two questions about Afghanistan. Taliban still didn't bring any change on their plan regarding Afghan women. And President Biden last week, he was concerned about uh, terrorist activity like Daesh and other terrorists. Uh, any comment about that? And also recently there is a, a report published that former Afghan House speakers under President Ghani's uh, government has been listed through by the U.S. Treasury. And like uh, him, there are so many people that they are involved 
and corruption in Afghanistan, as Mr. Afridi uh, raised this issue two, three years ago, and he keep asking me, uh, is there a U.S. Uh, uh, as a plan to, uh, you know, blacklisted other corrupt people in Afghanistan? So we have taken them? we have taken action to designate former members of, of the Afghan Parliament. Um, and their immediate family members, which renders them generally un ineligible to enter into the United States uh, because of their involvement in significant corruption. Uh, the Treasury Department has also designated uh, uh, these individuals under the Magnitsky Sanctions Program for their extensive role in transnational uh, corruption. Um, Treasury de designated a network of 44 companies connected to them for their role. Um, so I will say that we will continue to take action to um, uh, combat corruption, both in Afghanistan and around the world. And with respect to the first question you asked, of course, we continue to be con very concerned about the treatment of women and girls in Afghanistan. We continue to be um, very concerned about um, uh, the potential for terrorist activities in Afghanistan. We've made clear that we maintain the, the capability to conduct over the horizon uh, anti-terrorist Terrorism activities, and of course, we expect the Taliban to um, uh, prevent Afghanistan from being a haven for terrorism, as it has been in the past. And with that, we'll wrap, wrap, wrap for today. Thanks, everyone.